Praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Faith, Hope, and Love Ministries and Retreat Services Weekly Broadcast with Pastor William Whitfield, our senior pastor and founder. Today's word is entitled, Let Us Make Man in Our Own Image. Let us now join Pastor Whitfield in the Word. Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Whitfield coming to you on this Sunday, November 17, 2013, welcoming you to this weekly broadcast of Faith, Hope, and Love Ministries and Retreat Services International. As always, we are so pleased and so elated that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to join us here on social media. And we pray, as always, that the Word of the Lord will be an immense blessing to both you and your family and to those to whom you're sharing the Word of the Lord with. We pray that as we progress in this ministry, that as you find us to be a health to you, and that the word of the Lord coming through us has been a mighty blessing unto you, that you would consider writing us at fhlmrs12 at gmail.com. Our P.O. Box is also P.O. Box 183, Glen Burnie, Maryland, 21060. We would love to hear from you. And as always, we always mention that your financial support is for your local assembly or the house of God where God has planted you so that you might be a blessing to the household of faith and to the man and the woman of God that labors in the word of the Lord together. So today again, we're going to be talking about let us make man in our own image. And for those of you that are familiar with the script, this is in Genesis, the first and the second chapter, uh, where we're talking about God creating man. But I want to put a spin on it out of a thought that I had earlier this week. Because remember we talked before, and those of you that are student word know that Lucifer wanted to be just like the Most High God. So if he wanted to be just like the Most High God, it still has not changed. He wants to be like the Most High God in every aspect of that word, which means that if God said, let us make man in our own image, that Lucifer is also going to mimic that by saying the same, let us make man in our own image. So I want to add a second part to the title today, which would make it a little long, but this is just a subtitle. It's Transformers, Demons in Disguise. And that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about today. So if you have your Bibles, I'm asking that you turn with us to Genesis, the first chapter in the 26th verse, and the 27th verse as well, and we will also be looking at Genesis, the second chapter, and the seventh verse. And as always, we have other passages of Scripture that we will be going to. So we ask that you please have your Bibles ready so that you can follow along with us in the Word of the Lord together. Let us go into prayer before we go into the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, your precious son, who has come to make us free from all the oppressive devices and the natures and the transforming of the devil. So God, we know that your power is absolute and all praise, all glory, and all honor goes to you and no one else to the Lamb who was slain before the very foundations of the world, to God the Father, to Jesus Christ the Son, to the Holy Ghost. Those three are one. And God, we thank you that you've made us in your image and not in the image of our enemy, Lucifer the devil, or his army, the demonic beings. But God, we know that today there are many people that are so we pray as we go into the word of the Lord on today that you would open up our understanding and our eyes that we might see the truth of God in the word of the Lord on today. Praise the Lord, everyone. Again, it seems like every time that I deal with the subject of the devil, 
He always wanted to cause me or try to cause me to lose my voice. But we're going to plow through this message. And we're going to give you what the Lord has given unto us on today. So, the title again is, Let Us Make Man in Our Own Image. This is God talking with His Son and the Holy Spirit and the angels of heaven. <clears throat> Excuse me, His holy angels. And God is saying, after He has created all the animals, all the beasts of the field, after he has created all the fowls of the air, after he has created the earth and the vegeta vegetation, God now creates man. And he creates man formed from the dust of the earth. And let's go to Genesis, as we already mentioned, Genesis 1 and 26, and it reads, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion, have authority, dominion, rule, over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And Genesis 1 and 27 says, So God created man in his own image. The image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 2 and 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So if we really look at it, it said, first and foremost, it's God speaking. And those of you that know me know that I'm really adamant about God speaking and adamant about us hearing God and adamant that all of creation obeys his voice and all of heaven obeys his instructions, his commands, and his orders in heaven, there is perfection in the following of what God says, and how he says it, when he says it, and the detail to the minute, to the second, to the millisecond detail, the finite points of what he wants to be carried out, that it is followed by the very host of heaven without incident, without delay, without hesitation, without questioning, because they understand that when God speaks, there is per perfect will, perfect things behind it, and there are no flaws behind it. Therefore, he has an excellent track record that when he speaks, and it is and comes into being, that is flawless. So he says, God says, let us Make man in our own image. And one of the major questions today is what, <clears throat> excuse me, is truly the image of God in us? Is it our form? Is it our shape? Is it the fact that we have been created from the dust, which we know that he was, and in God, when it comes to godly imagery, he wants us as stated in previous messages, and I'll state it again, and we'll talk about that a little later as well in this message, he wants us to look just like him. That was his original intent. Let us make man in our own image, in the image of perfection, in the image of holiness, in the image of flawlessness. So he says, after our, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. He wanted us to have rule just as he has rule over all of his creation. But he gave us a domain within his creation that we should rule over. And God breathed and, and into the man's nostrils came the breath of his life, God's life in us. So that we would be the image after the image of God. 
Now, the word image means a physical likeness or representation of a person, or in this case, a deity of God himself. And it's also an optical, talking about the vision, counterpart or appearance of an object as is produced by reflection from a mirror. When we look into God and ultimately God looks into us, we look into God to see his perfection and his holiness and see his image. But ultimately at the end of the day, what God wants to be able to do is to look at us and to see his own self, his own reflection, his own glory being revealed or has been revealed or has been manifested. And each in every one of our lives, so ultimately through the workings of salvation, when we avail ourselves, submit ourselves, yield ourselves to prayer and to his will and to his authority and what he wishes to, for us to accomplish for him, and when we have completely sold out to him and he looks at us and he sees himself, then he has accomplished his works of creating us in his own image. And we reflect his likeness. Just as you look into a mirror, you're able to see your own reflection just as though I'm looking into this camera and seeing the monitors. I can see my own reflection. And sometimes when God looks at us, he doesn't always see his image in us. Sometimes he sees an image that is completely different, diverse, and completely something that he has never intended for us to look like. So I want to submit to you that our outward appearance isn't necessarily the image of God that we're referring to. The Bible says in the book of Timothy, I believe it's the first chapter, that a woman's a, the beauty should not come from her outward appearance. That it should come from the hidden beauty of the heart. And God told Samuel that you look at the outward appearance, but I'm looking at the heart. It's the heart, the inner being of a man that God is looking to see his own imagery and his own creation. And when he looks at the heart, because the heart is being changed, transformed into the image of God and the thinking of God, the mentality of God, the ways of God, by the word of God and by the spirit of God illuminating the word of God and working on the inside of us to bring the change from the internal to the external, then ultimately over our continents and over our bodies and over our faces, people should see that we have spent time with God and that we are his children and that we are in his likeness and in his image and imagery plays such an important role with God that the devil always wished to mock him at any opportunity that he can. Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Whitfield reminding you that we post messages on social media twice a week where you can view them 24 hours a day, 365 days out of the year by selecting a message that is relevant for your situation and hearing what God has to say to you. God bless you and join us as we declare the word of the Lord as we're empowering people to be free by the word of the Lord. Are you being formed and fashioned into the image of God? Or does the devil pretty much have your identity held up? Let us go back into the word of the Lord. The definition goes on to state that this is a mental representation or ideal or ideology or conception. In psychology, it's a mental representation of something previously perceived in the absence of the original stimulus. In other words, that that person or thing is progressing towards being what they need to become. They're saying here, in the absence of the original stimulus, which means that when God has done the initial work in us, 
whether we view the absence of his presence or knowingly that he is always with us, that even when we think that he is not with us, that we still are progressing along the paths to become just like him. Even if he backs off for a season and he doesn't hear our prayers, we know that we are still on point to be changed and transformed without him. Even in those seasons when it seems like our prayers aren't being heard, we're still progressing because sometimes we become such people that need stimulation. We need to feel the presence or see that people are concerned about us or caring for us even when they're not around or we don't get a phone call or an email or text since we're in this new technological age or whether we're missing that person because they're away but yet at the same time when a person is loyal and faithful and dedicated and is aware of their obligations to that person, they're going to make sure that everything on their part is done for the preservation of that relationship. So that means that in even in the absence of the stimulus of that person, I'm still going to work on perfecting that relationship. Nonetheless, with God, in the seasons when we think that God is not hearing our prayers or that we are not connecting with him in prayer or he's not speaking to us or not because we've done something wrong, but because he's testing and proving us to see whether or not we would remain on course with him and connected to him, even when he chooses to test you by not speaking or saying a word. When we go through those dreams, dry seasons, when we don't feel his tangible presence, when we don't feel the anointing of God, but yet we still must function and pray as though we are highly anointed and highly favored of him, and at the same time trusting him enough to know that the stimuli will return at the appointed time and season, but when it does, we would have already done the necessary preparation to repair, prepare for his ultimate return. That's the story of the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. The five wise prepared, although they didn't know when he was going to come or saw when he was going to come or heard wording or given an announcement that he was going to come. The five foolish virgins, because they didn't know when he was going to return, still thought they had enough time to play the fool. So in the hour when the announcement was made that the bridegroom cometh, the five wise virgins had enough oil in their lamp to go out to meet him. But the five foolish virgins who did not make preparations asked of the five wise virgins for some oil, which they would not comply. Because when you have prepared your soul to become into the image of God, it is a personal thing. That's why the Bible says to work out your own soul's salvation with fear and trembling, with respect and with honor towards the source of the one that you're preparing yourself for, keeping yourself for. And when that person arrives, you have secured what you needed to be able to go out to meet them and not squandering or someone who is foolish or unwise. So God keeps us in a state of mind that we should be prepared. And in the image of God comes his thought processes. When you are being made perfected in the ways of God, you begin to think the way that God thinks. You begin to prepare the way God would have you to prepare. You know in your heart intuitively by the Spirit of God or by what you know of God even when he is not communicating with you what is required of you in the seasons of your life that you're in. And you know what you must do to keep yourself pure and holy and prepared and ready in your garments prepared, waiting for the arrival 
of the Immaculate One, of God Himself. Now, going on here, God's desire for man to be made in His image. God's desire for man to look just like Him can be found in Galatians 4 and 19. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. And when you have time, I want you to read Galatians, the fifth, fourth chapter. As a matter of fact, the book of Galatians in its entirety. But one of the main things is that be ye holy, for I am holy, from Leviticus, the 20th chapter, and the seventh verse. And you'll find that repeated in 1 Peter 1 and 16. For God is holy, Pure. There is no flaws going back to him. No sin in him. He cannot sin. And he understands that we are man, flesh and blood, and created from the dust of the field, and that with Adam's fall, that there was a possibility, there is the possibility, there is the reality, that we will be made into a different image or having a different heart internally taking on the ill things and walking in those ways and having our initial intent or God's initial intent and full desire to be perverted within us to be changed drastically and horrifically and terribly in the wrong path of progression. And this is where the devil steps in and says, God created man in his own image. And now since man abides under my domain, and I have stripped him of his purity, I have stripped him of his godly dignity, I have stripped him of the opportunities to remain in a state of perfection in, in the Garden of Eden. I did what I did to remove the hedge of protection of God from around them. And I forced his hand to force them out. And to force them onto my territory. Now man is in legal play. But now I have a chance to exalt my throne by securing his humanity. And if I can't secure all of them, at least I'm going to secure the greatest numbers in the population of men that I can by transforming them into my image, the image of wickedness. The image of sin, the image of rebelliousness, the image of anger, the image of everything that is contrary to the will and the mind and the ways of God. Instead of them being ye holy, I want them to be just as vile and nasty and horrible and, and, and full of anger and vulnerabilities and, and opening up their doorway that not then now that God will not fill them with his Holy Spirit. But I will mimic the ways of God and I will fill them with my unholy spirit, my demons on assignment. Demons, transformers on assignment. Demons, transformers in disguise. And now, I will set up my kingdom, not in the heavenly realms, but on the earthly realms. And my subjects will be ignorant to what I'm doing. They will be naive to what my influences are. They will not only have blinders on their eyes, but they will have a deafening ear to hear what God is saying, but yet their ear will be attuned to what I'm saying because I'm going to keep the imagery of vileness before their face 
whether they see it in their associates, whether they see it on the television, whether they see it in the movies, I'm going to keep that which is wrong in before them and in their eyesight that over a period of time their hearts will rejoice in it. Their hearts will be glad with seeing the imagery that I'm projecting and portraying before them. And I'm going to make it so acceptable that they will hunger and they will thirst for it and they will be entertained by it both day and night and they will pay thousands upon thousands upon millions upon millions and billions of dollars per year to be entertained by gross darkness from the very depths of hell itself. And I'm going to unleash a spirit of wickedness so vile that they will not be able to see that it is unholiness parading itself before their very Luke the 11th chapter says, And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself shall be brought to desolation. A house divided against itself shall not stand. Now God's ways is for us to walk in holiness. The devil's way is for us to walk in unholiness. God's way is for us to walk in love. The devil's way is for us to walk in anger and bitterness. God's way is for us to walk in purity. The devil's way is for us to walk unclean and filthy and dirty and nasty and everything that would spiritually cause us to turn up our nose. Let me share this with you. When a person is sweetly filled with the Holy Spirit, you could be around them, and if your ears and your eyes and your nostrils are attuned in the spirit, you will smell a sweet-smelling aroma coming from their lives, because that's what God smells. And that smell is repulsive in the nostrils of the devil and his demons. But if you walk around someone that is of the devil, You'll pick up a smell, but it will be a stench that is horrific. And it's gut-wrenching and turning to the point that it will upset your stomach and your spiritual senses to know that there is something vile about this person spiritually. There are sounds that you will hear in the spirit in your ears, and there are things that you will see. And when you look at persons... Their imagery has transformed. There are people that are in sin. We always want to talk about certain spirits. But let me tell you, every sin has a transforming thing that appears either in the countenance of a person's face, in their language and how they talk, in their eyes, in the smell of their breath. In the things that you hear about them, their body shape and how they interact with people and even their persona changes because of a spirit, ungodly spirit that has tapped into their lives and changes them to the point that they don't understand that they have become transfigured in a negative sense. And some persons that have demonic possessions, you can see that demon in their facial expressions. You can see that demon operating in them. And you can see the separate body of that demon inside of that person moving a different way. And saying things that you know are far from the character of that people, person or causing that person to act. Or the voice patterns to change drastically. You could have a woman that may have a high-pitched voice, just an example. 
But yet when you hear that demon spirit speaking through them, you hear a deep voice, deeper than my voice, deeper than anything that you ever heard, deep enough to let you know that this is not a human voice. And sometimes it's just the opposite. Sometimes you hear grown men talking like little boys in their infancy because that demon has caused their voice patterns to change. You'll see people who have transformed their bodies, patterns where they look contorted, or even things that are heard or said, things that even bodily-wise that happen because they have been transformed or changed by a demonic spirit that cares absolutely nothing about that person other than occupying them as a host to victimize them and to use them the way that they want to use them to enact the will of the devil. Whether that is influencing anger or murder, they begin to look like a murderer. And sometimes you could tell people that are involved in criminal activities by demonic spirits because you feel the uneasiness when they walk into a room. You know that immediately your antennas go up because there is something going on in that person that is ungodly. And that's because of demonic influences. People have a spirit of whoredom. People have that have walked in dignity and honor who have changed. Now they've become something completely different. Why? Because the devil has entered into them. God always walks in compassion, but the devil walks in selfishness. God's defining of a man is that he was and is created in his image. The image of immortality. The image of holiness. And now, whether this speaks, whether God was saying when he said, let us create man in our own image. We know that this is not always, and this is not just the actual physical shape of a man. Or the actual spirit of, of a man. Notice God formed man from the dust of his creation, the earth. And he also breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. So the question arises, as I mentioned earlier, what does God mean that man was created after his image? We already talked about the physical shape. When he breathed the breath of life into him, God breathed himself into him. When you walk up to someone and you breathe or blow your breath into their nostrils, they have just taken on something from you into their body. They've ingested it, whether willingly or unwillingly. That's why it's such a big issue with secondhand smoke, if those of us that are around smokers. Because we know that once we breathe in that smoke, we breathe in some of the same elements that are within that cigarette that are harmful to us. And if you're in that environment for over a period of time, you can be impacted within your body. So when God breathes into us, he breathes everything in us for life and for holiness and righteousness. So when he breathes into us again by the spirit of the Holy Ghost, the self-same thing transpires. He brings a new spiritual awakeness to us. And that we are indulged into his kingdom by his breath. He breathes into us his intellectual ability, the Holy Spirit, that leads and guides us into all manner of truth that we need in certain cases, that we are in a situation that we need no man to teach us, but the Holy Ghost is there to instruct us, to lead and guide us. If we would but submit, we have to submit. Because if we don't submit, we're not going to follow his leading and his guiding. And that's what God ultimately wants. He breathes into us that he has created properties, that he has breathed into us, that we become created. That he has a domain that is just in the likeness of his domain that we are to occupy. And that he would have communication or that we would have communication with him continuously. Now... I want to go into the main thrust of this message today. We are talking about demons, transformers in disguise. 
But we ultimately are going to conclude this with God being victorious, with those of us that have been made into the image of darkness now being transformed into the image of light. We are always going to drive you. Remember, the theme of this ministry is empowering people to be free by the word of God. We don't want you to be in the image of the devil because there are ramifications and there are things that you will lose. And there's the destruction that will cover you for all eternity. And we don't want you to go in that path because that's not the desire or the design for God. God's desire and his will is that you would be with him for all eternity. But you can't be with him when the devil has legal rights to your soul and to your life. And let's find out why he has legal rights to your soul. It's high time that we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who have no clue of whose image they were created in. This is the very thing that the devil uses to cause them to think that they're less than who they are or more than who they are, all of which God can remedy by salvation and deliverance. Let us now go back into the word of the Lord. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before God, and Lucifer was there, and we know the story is found in the book of Job. And God asked Satan, where hast thou been? He said, to and fro. And God asked him a question, have you considered Job? And he said, in his response to God, but you have a hedge about him. But if you would remove that hedge from him, he would curse you to your face. And God, knowing what was in Job, he said, you may touch everything that he has, but you will not take his life. And Satan went out from the presence of God and began his deal on Job. Now the thing is this in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter and the 13th verse, and we're going to read down to the 15th. It says, for as such are false apostles, deceitful workers, listen, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. That's why I'm so animate with this thing about apostles. Because we have to be very careful with that title nowadays. And no model for Satan himself is transformed. Listen to this. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Verse 15. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The first thing notable here, yes, he talks about a leadership role, the apostles, those who follow Jesus, those who have been called to the apostleship, or those who transform themselves to be apostles. And they know the word. Let me tell you. <clears throat> Excuse me. The devil knows the word of the Lord. And let me tell you, he knows it far better than the most astute person on the face of the earth when it comes to the scripture. That's why you must remain in the presence of God and allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate you and stay connected to God and the Holy Spirit. That you will not be deceived by the spirit of the transformation of the dark one into the image of an angel of light. Because many of the elect of God will be fooled to think that this is the truthfulness of God manifested in a person that has taken on the persona of something that they are not. They now become wolves in sheep's clothing or imagery. But yet, all the while, in their hearts, there is the devouring, consuming nature to get to the inheritance of God, his people. 
and to utterly destroy them by consuming them individually, by duking them and speaking to them in such a way that they think that they have the authentic thing standing before them when they don't discern the real deal isn't there. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist that is standing before their very face, that is perpetrating a fraud, that is now preying upon their weaknesses and their compassions and their frailties and their honesty and their yieldedness and their respectfulness for the position or the title for which they hold, but on the inside they're just waiting for a chance to pounce and devour and consume. And their eyes are not open to the truth or what is about to happen to them. Nor are their spiritual senses inact or activated. They're inactive because you're talking about a person that has let down their guards through the spirit of trust. That what they're seeing is truthfully what they should be seeing. But it says not only here, but he is able to transform his image into an angel of light. And all the while in verse 15, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers or his servants or his demons also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. They're going to be destroyed. Now, God is saying, what is it that you really want from me? Or what is Satan's desire for you that you're not aware of? Satan's desire is for man to look just like him, and the only way that he can accomplish that is by filling them with demonic spirits. A lot of times there are people that have demonic possessions. We see the spirit of horror, the spirit of thievery, the spirit of lies, the spirit of abusiveness, the spirit of anger. And there is one situation or thing that I was watching early this week where this person had purchased a home and someone had killed themselves in this home. And that's why it's so important that when you move into a new place that you not only have someone come in and bless it, that you have someone come out and cast out every demonic spirit, every lingering harmful spirit, every spirit that will not exalt godliness but only will exalt harm and confusion and frustration and anger and bitterness and all the ways of the devil out of that abode so that you can dwell there spiritually safely and not have to contend with demonic forces. And in this home, over a period of time, someone had killed themselves there. And this demonic spirit of death and murder stayed there. And manifested itself in such a way that it ultimately ended up causing the husband of that home, of that family, to become extremely full with bitterness. He did not commit suicide, but his heart ruptured and through every orifice of his body, his blood came. And when his wife found him, it was too late. Her family kept urging her to get out of the house. And even one night, it forced her out of her bed and threw her to the floor. And we think that these things aren't real, but they're real. These are the workings of the devil. And as a result, she began to come progressively worse. But when she really made up her mind to move out, out of that house, that spirit slapped her and you saw the scars on her face visibly because they were bleeding. And as a result, she vacated that home with nothing more than what was on her back. The devil had taken full possession of that home. Now, there are some times that we think that these things are just fictitious. But those of us who walk in the realm of the Spirit and know the ways of God and walk in deliverance ministry, when we urge you to take heed to these things, it's not because these things don't exist. We're telling you because we have witnessed it with our own eyes as the men and the women of God. When we have ministered and prayed for folks and asked folks to confess their faults and sins, and when they are progressing towards the house of God, and that Spirit does not want to give up on what they have owned, 
own or possess for so long, then they begin to fight and become vile with us and with the individuals. And Jesus himself dealt with that with the demonic boy. That threw him into the fire, the father that came to his disciples and asked, why not could your disciples cast him out? But Jesus said, but these things go off not out but by fasting and praying. There's a story also in the scripture. Before we get to that, about a young lady in the book of Acts. But let me go to Isaiah 14 and 13. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. He knew he would not be the most high God. But what he does is he plays upon wordings and imagery. I will be like the Most High God. In verse 16, they that, and let me go to 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee and say, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake? Kingdoms that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. All the kings of the nation, even all of them lie in glory, everyone in his own house. But thou art cast out of the grave like an abominable branch, and as the remnant of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword, that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. God ultimately will destroy him because he has entered into people and violated the imagery of God in the earth. We will return to the word of the Lord after this brief break. Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Whitfield, Senior Pastor of Faith, Hope, and Love Ministries and Retreat Services International, reminding you that we post messages to social media twice a week that can be viewed 365 days a year. You could go in and select the message that is relevant for the need that you have in your life at the moment and hear what God has to say to you. Remember, our theme is empowering people to be free by the word of the Lord. God bless you and be blessed by the word unto you. Now let us go back into the word of the Lord with Pastor Whitfield. When God calls us, he calls us into his own imagery. <clears throat> and everything that we need is given to us in that time. So when the devil transforms people, he transforms them into what he wants. If he wants them to be and this will operate in the spirit of whoredom, he makes them walk and be transformed into that spirit. When he wants them to walk into the spirit of anger, he puts a spirit of anger in them. When he wants them to walk in lies, he causes a spirit of perverse lying to come into that. That they become compulsive, habitual liars by a demonic spirit. When he walks, wants him to walk into perverseness, he causes a spirit of perversity to come into their lives. And they act out the perverse acts or actions that he so desires. And they take on the countenance of a perverse, whether it's a pervert or perverted person that's into pornography or into elude images and things of that nature or elude relationships, people that will seek out other people. You have the swingers that are going on now. People that are swinging that are married will go out and marry, will be with someone else's wife or will walk, or welcome them into their own bedroom to watch that person have relations with their spouse, whether male or female, or they're swinging, or they're on the down low, or whatever the case you may be. He causes those spirits to come into that person's life. He causes the spirit of murder. That's why I'm so concerned about our young men, whether Caucasian or African American or all other ethnicities. We're seeing it played out in the media that the devil is really, is really running rampant with this spirit of murder. We see mass shooting 
shootings. We see gang shootings. We see shootings of people that are angry with their spouses or committing murder. And even when you're walking in anger or bitterness, it's best to go and seek help or counseling from somebody, whether it's through a minister in the church, whether it's through your pastor, whether it's through professional counseling, or whether it's seeking out psychiatry, or whether you need to commit yourself to a facility or a hospital or an institution so they can help you along or seek deliverance and Especially from the household of faith, from God himself. Because this is a spirit that has entered into you by the devil himself to transform you out of that sweetness of life or even the point that you may not have been completely changed or transformed or not started on the path towards salvation. But the devil is doing everything that he can to play for keeps and to keep his tight grip around your neck to ultimately strangle you out so that he can kill you in the transformation of the darkness in the perversity of his kingdom. Let me tell you this, he also gives the spirit of deception to make you think that you are right. Spirits of demonic influence brings you to the point of seeing things that aren't correct. That's why you have a difficult time convincing someone that has a demonic influence, people that have anger and bitterness that I've dealt with. It's a very difficult challenge to be able to show them who they really are, for them to see their own image and to see what the devil is doing to them. Their feelings easily are offended and things that they feel and touch aren't the same that we, we see. You can speak love to them and they will move with a spirit of bitterness and anger. I remember once at a funeral that I spoke at and God gave me the message of love. Now listen carefully. This was a young man who was murdered brutally as a result of his involvement in the gangs. And a lot of the gang members were there at this funeral home that I preached at. And the message that God gave me was love, and all I talked about was love. And after the funeral, we found out, funeral, we found out that word has gotten back, got back to us that there was quite a number of people in the audience or in the congregation that was looking to bum rush the podium, the pulpit, and beat me up because I taught or preached on love. You have to wonder, what would cause such bitterness and anger to arise in persons when God is talking to them about his love, pure love, not throwing it in their faces, but all he talked about was his love towards them. His love to see them come out of sin. His love to change and transform them. But that demonic spirits or spirits that were in them was antagonizing them to think that someone was attacking them when God was only talking about him loving them and them coming to love him in return. That's some serious stuff. When a demonic spirit has that much control and influence over how he has transformed you, that you can't see the truth because he has you blinded to the truth. And not to realize that that anger and the lifestyle that you're leading is appropriate and pleasing God. And the thing is, is that most of them believe that if they lived a good life, regardless of what their actions were, murdering someone or not, or drug dealing in drugs, they thought that they still were on the path to going to heaven. How sad that the devil has blinded them to that degree. So when he comes in to transform, he changes a person's hearing. He influences them. He changes their appetites. And he even transforms a person's persona and image and bodily features and functions to cause them to be in the image 
that he wants. I already talked about the voice pattern and the bodily odors that emits out of persons that are so possessed. They're distorted. Their, their eyes are distorted. Their energy level is either heightened or diminished as a result of that spirit. The change of their thought processes. And sometimes you can see a person that had sound thought processes. But once a demonic possession comes in, their thought processes are just ludicrous, crazy, off the chart, off the chain. And that you cannot convince them that their logic that they're walking in at a time is just off kilter. Their appetite changes. Their endurance or lack thereof. The draining of their physical energy. Their bodies contort. They're caused to speak languages that are unknown to any, any person on the face of this earth. Their language becomes purely demonic. Sometimes the wording and the tongues that they speak in, you could tell is out of the very depths of hell. Even sometimes these spirits will even cause them to speak foreign languages in order to communicate and to mimic what God can do by the Holy Spirit to speak to nationality. And they cause people, listen to me, listen. They cause people to believe that idols are their gods. They cause philosophies and ways of teaching that are so off from the ways of God to be seen and viewed and comprehended and received and embraced as though they are truths. And spiritually, they will not break away from them. This is the same thing that walks in the spirit of injustices. They will always see things that are, they think are justice when it's far from the justice ways of God's word or the laws of the land or even the laws of God's word. Here's where people begin to pervert rightful laws and change the laws of the land to meet whatever means they feel is possible or needful for that moment in their era or that age. They will change whatever they need to change on the political scene. They will seek out who they need to seek out politically to make those changes in the laws to meet their means and their agendas. And they will not stop there because the devil wants to make sure that this world looks like his kingdom. And he fills us with delusions, spirits of delusions, spirits of associated by legal, legal legalities, one having rights to a person's soul due to the fact that one has not been fully delivered from a previous possession. God spoke to me about an individual earlier this week and said that the reason why they're seeing or having demonic visitations, although that they're saved, although they see spirits come through doors and show up in their, in their dreams and in their houses or hear things walking back and forth, is because there is legal right still in them that they've not been delivered from, and they have a possession that they need to be set free from, and it doesn't matter about their title or their position or the service that they're performing for me until they get rid of that demonic possession. They will always have these visitations from the dark side. It's not that they don't belong to me. They are mine. But they have not sought me for deliverance. They sought me from freedom from the antagonizing and antagonistic spirits. But I cannot move because my hand is being held back because you will not acknowledge the truth about yourself. And until you awaken in your spirit and realize that everything that you have done to every person in your life is a result of your failure to ask me to completely deliver you. And when I bring people to your sight 
or to you to forewarn you or to make you aware of it, you do not embrace, you do not hear, you do not listen, you reject them. And in your rejection of me sending my word through them, I have rejected you from being fully delivered and set free unto you embrace the method of deliverance that I've sent your way. It's not that I don't want you to be free. I want you to see your need to be free because I will not as your God violate your rights to come into your life and to remove things until you recognize and acknowledge it and ask me to come in. Yes, I'm your God. Yes, I'm your Lord. Yes, I'm your Savior. Yes, I'm living in you. But I'm telling you, there is a coexistence in you that the Holy Ghost himself has been forewarning you of, and you have turned a deaf ear to it because you believe that you're greater than what you really are, and you don't understand that the devil has decept deceived you and blinded you to keep you in darkness so that you will not be fully free, be fully free to be the powerhouse that I've intended you to be. And once you receive your full deliverance, when you see that you have need of it, and that you need to walk in it, and I will set you free, and when God sets you free, he will show you what you missed. But he's going to put you on a fast track to receive all that he would have for you to receive in him. When God fast tracks a saint, it's because God wants them to get there quickly and expediently. Nothing in all of heaven or earth or the very depths of hell can stand in one's way when God is progressing them and transforming them forward. This spirit has been sent to mock you. It's been sent to mock the God in you. And it's designed to ultimately destroy you. It appears to the person in various images to antagonize and to harass you. To violate and rob you of your peace, of your sleep, of your contentment, of your joy, and are assigned to wreak havoc in one's life by destroying every wholesome relationship. Whether that be with God, whether that be with humanity, whether that be with your husband or your wife or your children or those that are associated with you or want to be associated with you because they could bring something into your life, another dimension and another level of God that you constantly reject because that's what that spirit wants you to do. You will not fellowship with your brothers and your sisters because you feel as though that in them, that everything that is in them is designed to tear you down when you don't recognize or understand that God has continuously sent people your way to help build you up, to help establish you, that had wisdom and integrity and the intellect and the know-how and the innate ability to help you to hold up your arms and to teach and to instruct and you've rejected all of them because that was that's what that spirit of the devil wanted you to do. So that he could keep you in a world, in a bubble, to think that you're A-OK, -okay, that you're okie dokie all right, when all the while you're trying to be happy, but you're living in a false delusion of your own perceived happiness that isn't fulfilling, but tormenting all the while. This is destroying your honor, your dignity, your respectfulness in the church world community. It's designed to ultimately make you look like a blatant fool. And the devil is using all of those tools. And you don't understand as much as you submit your knees to God. Whenever you refuse deliverance, you are that much more submitting your need and your life to the very hand of the devil who is transforming you supposedly into the image of light.
but really has you blinded by the darkness of your own vile existence to see the truth that God wants to deliver you into the next seasons of the blessedness of your life. Transformation means to change in image or appearance or structure, to go through a metamorphosis. You gone into a cocoon, but it wasn't the cocoon that God intended for you to go in. To change in condition, nature, or even your character to convert it to something that is less than God. There is electricity of source moving through your body, through your body, to your spirit that God never intended. And you become charged when you're, when you're nasty and mean to people because you think your title gives you the rights to operate that way. It causes you to distort and to blow up things that logical people will look at and say, we can work through this, we can navigate through this, but it causes you to blow up things and make them so bigger than what they truly are. That you can't see that you've been put on a fast track to cause destruction and bitterness amongst the brethren. But you think that your ways are right for you between you and God. This is the change that comes through the thing where one is exposed to not the will of God, but to the ways of the devil. Here are people that says this, listen. When Jesus was talking in Mark, the third chapter, and he says, and to have power to heal the sickness and to cast out devils. But listen to Mark 3 and 21, which I found to be rather fascinating. The first part of that verse, Mark 3, 21, and when his friends, this is talking about Jesus, when Jesus' friends heard of what he was doing, Jesus had friends. He was not friendless, as many of us would think that he was. He was popular in his youth, and he had friends. He was not rejected on that level. When the Bible said that he was rejected and despised of men, he's talking about him being rejected and despised by the religious world that should have recognized him and should have acknowledged him. But now his friends are now rejecting him because they think that he is beside himself. And let's read that verse and you'll hear that. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, he is beside himself. In verse 22, and the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, he had Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. So they're saying that he has been transformed by the devil. But what they don't realize, that he is the very God of glory, incarnate in the flesh. He does not have a devil. He is not the devil. As a matter of fact, he came to bring destruction to the devil's devices and to deliver us and set us free continuously. It's a shame when we don't recognize the vehicles that God is using to bring our salvation and our deliverance and bring us to the point where we need to be. So he goes on to say, but Beelzebub is the chief demon of Satan, or, or the devil, or Satan himself. Devils casting out devils, this is purely delusional. For the Bible goes on to say, Jesus said, a kingdom divided against itself shall not stand. And 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, which we already talked about. But more so importantly, and verse 23, and he called them unto him and said unto them in his parable, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. And we call those people that are divided against themselves 
lunatics. Crazy. What he's saying is that there is no way that I can be divided against myself, nor will Satan be divided against himself. He is consistent on his path, and so is Christ on his path. So the two have come to war against one another, and Satan's house is never going to be divided to accomplish his will. And as much as we think, they work in unity. He is a strict disciplinarian, but he works in unity with his demonic forces, and they work in sync with him, just as the angels work in, a, in sync with Jesus. There's a story in Acts that gives us a perfect example of this. Acts, the 16th chapter, the same follow Paul in us, and Christ, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show, us, show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul being grieved, listen, when there's a force that says for God, but it's not from God, it's going to cause you to be grieved, which I talked about earlier. And Paul being, but, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, now this was a demonic spirit perpetrating itself as though it were the spirit of light. I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. And their purpose was to kill them or to imprison them because their hopes of gain was now lost. Now go on to say in verse, Mark back to verse, it goes to verse 27. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his good except he first bind the strong man and then he shall spoil his house until you bind Lucifer. And Lucifer is not going to bind himself. Let me tell you how foolish that would be for a person to bind themselves. If you love the work that God is doing in our ministry, we solicit your prayers before the throne of the grace of the true and the living God, that he may strengthen us to accomplish all that the Lord has assigned our hands to do. Write us at fhlmrs12 at gmail.com and let us know how the word has been a blessing unto you. Now, let us go back into the word of the Lord with Pastor... As a child... I used to love watching Superman. I remember one day I was homesick from school. I had to be about six, seven, probably a little bit older than that. And one day my mother put me down to take a nap. And we were in my sister's bedroom. So she decided when I laid down, she would lay down beside me to, to sleep. So I'm still a little bit full of energy. I took a quick nap and woke up before she did. And I wanted to play Superman. So I took something and tied myself, put something around my mouth and over my eyes to, 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 to uh, cover my eyes, to blind me, and to gag myself. But before I did that, or after I did that, with the, with the blindfold up so I could see, tie my hands and pull the blindfold down. And in some kind of way, I was limber enough to get my feet up and over my hands so that now my hands are tied behind my back. And I'm thinking, I'm playing that I'm going to be able to slip my legs back over my hands and untie myself and undo everything before my mother wakes up and has no knowledge of it. Me as a young child, not thinking or not understanding, just playing, when she woke up, I was un had been unsuccessful with reversing the process. So when she woke up and saw me, of course, she was alarmed because she thought that someone may have broken into the house and tied me up. And here I am lying here blinded, gagged, and bound with my hands behind my back as a young child. So I wouldn't be difficult to overpower. So she's thinking that someone had came into the house knowing that she was asleep and did what, she, what they needed to do. So, of course, when she untied me and asked me what was going on, should she call the police or not? And I explained to her I was playing and this is what I did. 
course, I was disciplined for that and banned from watching Superman, punished from it for a while. But that was a child. That's the way we handle things back then. But the same thing is, if I'm looking to gain territory and I'm looking to secure other souls, why would I fight my own efforts? Why would I buy my own self? Here's Jesus saying, and first, in order to take down the strong man, you must enter into his house and you must bind him. The Bible says, whatever we shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven spiritually. Whatsoever we shall loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. We are here to deliver people from the demonic forces and transform them into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That is our sole purpose for being here. The thing is, Psalms 106 and 37, I'm going to start reading at verse 36. And they serve their idols, which are a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrifice their sons and their daughters unto devils. We don't want to sacrifice our sons and our daughters to devils or to demons. Because we make them the prime candidate to be transformed. By the spirit of darkness in the earth. Remember, I stated all this to say this. That our desire is that you be completely free. We want you to be empowered by the word of the Lord unto you. So that you could break free from every stranglehold of the devil. That you could break free from everything that binds you and grips you. That you could break free from everything that he's attempting and desirous to do to you because he wants to keep you for his kingdom. But God said this, Jesus said this, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And we want you to have life and have it the way that Jesus says, more abundantly. The devil can never transform you when you're pursuing God with all your heart, with all your soul, and you are yielded as an open vessel saying, God, whatever is in me that is not like you, take it out of me. If I don't see it or if I'm not acknowledging it, if it's not been brought to my attention, God, open me up so that I can see as you see so that you can work on me to remove every area of vileness out of my life. Every legal ground that belongs to the devil, God, I want it out of my life because I only want you and you only. I don't want another source to inhibit my life, to control me. I want you completely in me to will and to do of your will and to do of your glory. Today, friends, if you've heard the word of the Lord, God wants you to be transformed, delivered from every demonic influence and spirit so that you will not be considered legal ground for the devil. This word is pretty simplistic. Some of you may think it's pretty deep, but this is pretty simplistic. And I want you to receive Jesus Christ into your heart. There is no other name given under the heavens whereby men must be saved. And that is the name of Jesus Christ. Today, pray with me if you're ready to surrender your entire life over to the Lord. Father, I pray that you come into my heart. Forgive me of all sins and iniquity and anything that I have been blinded to. Open my ears that I might hear what your spirit and only your spirit has to say to me. Open my eyes to only see truthfulness and the truth of what you would have me to see, regardless of how severe or how serene or how vile that truth may be. I need to see it so that I can cry out to you to say what must I need to do to be saved or to be free. 
And as I'm praying those prayers as a result of what you have revealed, I know that you're not a man that you will lie. And I know that you stand by your word to perform it. I know that you sent your word and it healed all of our diseases. I know that your word will not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish that which it was sent forth to do. Today, allow the power and the authority of your word to accomplish in me what your intentions are through all eternity. And as you do so, God, I will submit, I will surrender, I will find a place of fellowship and worship where I can be taught and learn the word of the Lord and your ways. And I will pattern my life after your will for my life. And I give your name all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Friends, if you have prayed that prayer, and you believe the Lord himself has heard you. And you want to make someone aware and known of that truth and that fact. I want you first and foremost ask God to lead you to a place where the truth of his spirit is being taught. Where the word is not compromised. Where it's not watered down where the servant of the Lord takes time to lay and pray and to study and to seek the face of the Lord to hear what God is saying for him to lead you to that place and that you will become a disciple there to learn the ways of God that you will let them know that you've heard the word of God and that it has changed and transformed your life and you want to know all that you can know about God and receive the gift of his Holy Spirit and to be baptized in Jesus' name into the sonship, into the kingdom of spirit-filled believers. That you will avail yourself to be taught in Bible studies on Sundays and Sunday school. And that you will gain a hunger and thirst for God. Write us also to let us know how this word has been a blessing unto you. You can post your comments right there to social media. Or you can email us at fhlmrs12 at gmail.com. Or send your email to Faith, Hope, and Love Ministries and Retreat Services International. P.O. Box 183, Glen Burnie, Maryland, 21060. For your prayer request, you could call and leave your prayer request at 443 392 6898. We would love to hear from you. God bless you. Until next week, this is Pastor William Whitfield saying, I love you with the love of the Lord, and God loves you best. Be blessed and have a wonderful week enjoying Jesus. Until we meet here again, God bless you and yours. We want you to keep in mind that you are created in God's own image. And because he has created you in his image, you are a target for the devil. Keep yourself clean, pure, and in the love of God because he loves you, and cares for you, and he embraces you throughout all eternity. Honor him and accept him into your life. Never leave him or walk away from him because he is there even when you least expect it.